if there's a characteristic that really describes sort of my approach to things is determination. When I want mm-hmm. something or I yeah. see something that I want to do, like I will do whatever it takes to understand what it takes to be there. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, a podcast about women who work in sports. I'm your host, Jahan Blake. After 15 years of working for three major league teams, including the Boston Red Sox, Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Chicago Cubs, I discovered the one thing I loved the most was helping women in sports shatter glass ceilings and take their seat at the table. I loved it so much that I made a business out of it. I have the honor of coaching high-performing women in the sports and entertainment industry and supporting them as they go after exactly what they want in their career. So if you are feeling tired of waiting on the sidelines, done being overlooked for promotions, and you're ready to pull ahead of the pack and take your career to the next level, girl, I'm here for it. I also created the Game of Her Own podcast to support you as well. We are here to share the stories of incredible women who work in sports and entertainment. These leaders and trailblazers will inspire you with their success and the lessons they've learned along the way to the top. Ladies, there is nothing like women empowering women. I am so honored you're here. Think back to your senior year, or if you're not a senior, hit fast forward for me. All right, everyone with me? Good. So now it's your senior year and you do what seniors often do. You go to a job fair in search of your first full-time job at a college. Imagine going to said job fair and receiving six job offers. Six. That is exactly what happened to my next guest, Deanna Witter, Chief Revenue Officer for the Houston Dynamo, Houston Dash, and PNC Stadium. Now, before I go on, does anyone else do like a little fist pump or maybe a big fist pump when they see a woman in sports in the C-suite? I know I do. I love to see it. All right, Game of Thrones listeners, I cannot wait for you to hear my conversation with Deanna. Y'all, she brings it. You will be inspired by her determination. I should warn you, it's contagious. We talk about why she believes she should graduate from every role that she's in, what you should be thinking about when it comes to getting paid your value. And she also shares negotiating tips and what she believes is a red flag. She talks about why you should always be in growth mode. Listen, y'all, Deanna was named to the Sports Business Journal Game Changers class of 2020, and it is no surprise. All right, Game of Thrones listeners, it is time. Let's do this. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Deanna, I am so excited. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. So a lot of people have told me over the years that I should meet you. So I kind of feel like I'm excited to finally get to meet you and spend some time with you. Um, But before we get into your amazing career and all the stuff that you've done, take us back in time and tell us when you first fell in love with sports. Oh, man. When I tell my career story, I start at this place, too. It's sort of the origin. So I'm glad you're starting here because I think it's so important. But give you a little background. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm from Flint, Michigan. I was raised in Flint, Michigan. I was raised by a single mother. And by the time I was 10, my father and his entire family were out of my life by then, um, unfortunately. And it was it was a strange time, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the best things my mom ever did for me was let me start playing sports at a young age. I was about I think I was eight years old when I started playing basketball and I was 10 when I started playing soccer and instantly being a part of a team really filled this gap of belonging that I felt at that stage of my life. It was sort of like a extended family. You know, I, I felt like I had a place also, you know, being mixed. I was raised by my mom and my grandparents who are all white, you know, as well. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of layers of belonging that sort of felt there. But what I loved about being a part of a team, it just filled that. You had a role to play and you contributed to a bigger thing. And it just really connected with me. And so becoming an athlete gave me purpose. And it's that purpose that really set me on path to sort of live my life out through in and within the environment of sports. That's a beautiful story. Like it's filled with some pain, it's just real, but also you know? some just like, yeah, it's real. And it just kind of shows how resilient kids are also. Yeah. And, and, and also really helps understand the power of sports and how important sports is yes. at the youth level and making sure it's accessible to all kids from all walks of life. And so I think about accessibility, you know, I played soccer, you know, I think we ended up getting a scholarship so I can afford it because we can have the registration for it. I played at the Y, which always gave you a break too. So it was those things as well. And 
my mom had a rule that once I think I got to 10, we had to move out of my grandparents' house. And her rule was you can continue to play in sports as long as you can walk to them. So I was so lucky that there was, I think if I, if I recall, I looked it up, it was like, I ended up walking like half mile to the soccer field for practice after school, you know, on my own. And, you know, just like kids don't have those same challenges today, you know, maybe they, maybe they do, but I, I haven't, you know, I don't talk to too many kids. I drive my kids you know, everywhere now. Right. Right. I would never dare to let them walk themselves to some place, but, but yeah, it was just sort of my reality. I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong here, were you, I mean, she gave you that, you know, boundary you can play, but so long as you can walk, were you excited? Like, yes, oh my I God. can walk to all these places. So you looked at it as I get to walk to all these places. Not that I have yeah. to. Yeah, right? I was free. It was freedom. And that walking to mm-hmm. those places also allowed me to walk up to the store and get, you know, feed my candy addiction and, you know, rent movies <laughs> at the local movie place. And if anybody's listening, that's from Michigan, you know, that there's a 10 cent deposit can deposit. So you would get your cans and return them and get your money and buy stuff at the store. So I had like this whole freedom, you know, as a kid to sort of explore and be independent, you know, it was a really unique sort of upbringing, but yet yeah, so um, impactful to the person I became, you know. Is that when the candy addiction started? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. Uh, Yeah. For for you, for those who are listening, I already exposed to Jahan that I'm a candy addict and um, the people who know me already know that. So, but yes, that's exactly, I ate more candy than food as a child. So yeah, I think people are surprised when I say that and my teeth are normal. So um, I've had a good, I've had a good dental (laughs) in my older years. Yes. So tell us this, when did you make that transition? Like sport really was, was life for you, a way of life, a way of belonging. When did you make that transition into, I want to work in sports? When I was 14, just as you said, like sports was my life. It was everything. So any way that anybody would connect with me was obviously through sports. Um, And so my mom, I, I think she really just tapped into that. And one of the things that she did was anytime that she could get access to take us to a Pistons game or a hockey game or really anything that was happening at the Palace of Auburn Hills. Um, her company had access to tickets. She would pile up the car with all the kids at the apartment complex and we would go up there and go to games and sit in some of the worst seats, sometimes good seats. And uh, I was a kid outside that was always waiting for autographs. And, you know, like that was sort of the thing that was so important to me. Yeah. And so for my 14th birthday, um, she worked it out with a friend to create just a remarkable, memorable experience for me. And for me, it it was a life-changing experience. And so she was able to hook it up where me and my best friend got to sit at the scores table courtside at a Detroit Pistons Golden State Warriors game. And I still have the ticket. I have, I have the ball that I got autographed in the behind the scenes. Like I have all the stuff. It was so impactful. And what I remember most about the experience though, was I just remember all these people walking around in suits. And I was like, I don't know what these people do. I want to, I want to do that. Like there was, there was this connection that I had where I just figured these people in suits is what puts this whole thing on. This doesn't all just happen by itself. And the experience I'm having right now in this moment was because of somebody probably right here in front of me and I don't even know it. And Mm -hmm. I just sort of planted that seed in my head that I wanted to be a part of creating that sort of energy and those memories and those experiences that can ultimately inspire you to think outside of what normal is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so Mm -hmm. that's where the seed was planted. And I just knew that I had to go to college. I had to explore this career path. I thought my pathway to college was going to be through sports. Unfortunately, I wasn't as good as an athlete as I wanted to be. I had the passion, (laughs) the heart, but maybe not so much the talent. I had opportunities to play soccer, you know, but but ultimately I knew my drive and my focus was on much bigger things. I had sort of a vision of the life I wanted to lead and I was going to do whatever it took to, to lead that and create that. So I ended up going to Central Michigan University with the focus to work in sports. Ended up starting out, I thought at first to stay, like the, the leaving the team piece was really hard for me to overcome in my head. And I'm sure other athletes have felt that way as well. But so I thought athletic training might've been my path and it would leave me on the yeah, bench and yeah. still make me a part of the team. So I did like a semester of athletic training and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> it, was, it was like one, I'd never been injured. So I didn't know that full component, but two, it was torture to think about sitting on a bench, which I never sat. And then um, watching somebody else play the game that you love. And I was like, there's just no way. So I thought, well, let me go back to what this all started. What the, let's go back to that Pistons game 
who are the people in suits? Like I've never quite made that connection of who those people were. So I just did my research as a freshman. I went on the Pistons website um, at the very bottom, looked up job opportunities, and I was just going to explore titles and then do research on titles from there. That was the plan. And then they were promoting this career fair. You know, every team, you know, hosts career fairs. And I was like, oh, there's a career fair coming up. And I think it was December, February, whatever. And so I signed up, I registered, and I went out to the career fair as a freshman. I went to every table that was a sports team. And I just said, I'm a freshman. I know I can't get a job right now. I'm literally here to learn. What are the jobs? Who is it that you hire? And what should I do as a freshman to change my path so that I would be somebody that you would hire for an internship as a junior and then hopefully a job as a senior? And they were so nice and they were so impressed with just my thought process here and gave me phenomenal advice, changed my major. I ended up serving like, and that's why I was introduced to sort of the sales world and ticket sales and what it was. And it really helped me understand that sales is where we create fans and we build that energy in arenas and stadiums to create the environment in which athletes can succeed within. Like, man, this is this is it. <laughs> like, I'm going to be able to pay this forward with the experiences I had. So that was my focus. And so I changed my major. I started serving tables so I can get the sales experience and bartending. And I ended up getting a great internship with you at golf, where I got to do sort of like an inside sales-esque experience. And then my senior year, I was invited to an NBA career fair where I was able to walk away with six job offers with six NBA teams. Whoa. Yeah. It was like, boom, you know, it was just like, all the hard work and, you know, just wow. really intentional. Like I would say from the very beginning, you know, my path and everything I've done has been extremely intentional. Wow. Okay. So I have lots of questions about this. Here. <laughs> so the, but the first one, right. As a freshman, where did that come from? Like, were you nervous? Like what, like you put together a really good plan, but like, give us a, a like behind the scenes peek at like how you came to like, say, I'm just going to go and ask questions and all that stuff. I think the interesting thing about my personality is because of the way I was, I was raised as a kid, Mm -hmm. like in sort of this independent environment, I was always sort of trusted to be an adult and I was in adult circles. I had, I had to face adult situations and I just never saw myself as less than or younger unexperienced. I mean, anybody who wants to learn anything has to ask questions. To me, it was sort of a, an acceptable approach and that I wasn't exposing myself or putting myself in a situation, you know, that would hinder my opportunity. So for me, I didn't go in with any real sense of fear, but just more of a sense of curiosity. I think that's where the connection really started to hit. I think the interview processes and stuff. Yeah. You know, I like, you want to show up. That's when like the nervousness starts to set in and and you're going to have to talk yourself through those, those, that process. But but the, the freshman going into a career fair and asking questions in the way that I did, you know, I, I never, I never looked at it as a, as a fear situation or environment. Yes. I love that. Just, and you make me think of some women who are nervous about networking and let's call, you know, what you did that, that, that was networking and that yeah, was talking yeah, and learning. And, and so, so many people are like, I don't want to do it. I don't have anything to add. And, and here is this freshman in college who was just learning and is super opening about open about it. And it sounds like to me, everyone wanted to help. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I think where, you know, there's a sense of just, like I said, curiosity. I came at things with a lot of confidence. Like I just want to learn because if I get this opportunity, like I'm going to kill it. I know I'm going to be great. I have the passion. And I think there were moments, maybe more so like once I broke in where I had to realize that maybe the energy in that regard could come off a little cocky. And then I had to learn those things, you know, throughout the process, but, but no, yeah, it was, it was very much like, let me help, you know, let me help, you know, and I, I was really open about telling a little bit of my story, but not exposing too much, you Uh know, just enough to realize that like this matters to me and I want to make an impact. I just want to make a difference, you know, and be a part of this world that has done so much for me. All right. And then let's fast forward four years to your six job offers. Like, how did you make that decision? And I get a very, when I like, I mean, we've known each other now a solid 21 minutes, but (laughs) I get this like confidence from you. Like, and did you feel that way going into it that you were like, oh, I'm going to get like at least six or seven offers? No, I went into that going, I just hope I can gain the attention from the Pistons. Like that was the dream job. I had no thought in my mind about how big this event was, you know, I was naive to what it was, you know, I, I I had no idea 
what I was walking into. And my, my main focus was I just need to impress the Pistons and get this job and almost like to set forth on this dream I had to, mm. you know, sort of scale up the ranks of the Pistons and run the Pistons. So, you know, it was like, that was sort of the initial thought. And it's one of the first things I did as I walked right up to an awesome, incredible guy. His name is Jim Lepore. And I, he was wearing his little Pistons, you know, name tag. And I just went up to him and I was like, Hey, my name is Deanna. I'm from Flint, Michigan. And I told him my story and he was like, okay, I almost want to tell you to leave right now because <laughs> everybody's going to steal you. It was one of the most greatest compliments. And, and he goes, but no, this is a great experience and you should talk to everyone because you're going to, you're going to have a great weekend. And he was so kind and so nice. And we continue to have coming. We're Facebook friends still today. And he's just a great individual in my life throughout those early years, especially. And so that was eye opening. And then to start to just work the room and start introducing yourself to people. It was a unique event because once you started to introduce the person to each other, you start making connections. But there was this other thing that I didn't learn until later because I went back and started recruiting at that event. The next year I get to go back. The teams, once you hear a name, they start to then like go after you because they know another team. So there's a big competition thing between the teams about getting the the talent, like the top people. And so you could be skewed as the top talent just because one person was talking to you and they have no, they never even met me. It was sort of an interesting environment. It was fun. It was crazy. I would imagine similar to how somebody feels being recruited like into sports in a big NCAA, you know, school or something like it had that feel to it. But yeah, I broke it down. I mean, you asked, you know, the 16 time broke. I think there was two teams right away. I just knew that, you know, this didn't fit right in terms of like, it's like a six month program. It felt very far from home. Just, you know, those, those teams, I sort of went to the side and I focused in on four teams. And it was, of course, the Pistons, the Cavaliers, the Pacers and the Phoenix Suns. And these were great organizations with great leaders. The people I met were incredible. Um, I actually got to visit coming out of the event, I was invited and I, I know other recruits were invited too to go to each of the markets and meet the teens and meet the executives. So you really got to make a, a really informed decision. They were all offers. And so you got to really, you know, determine like what's the best environment in which I feel like I can succeed in. And, and to be honest with those four organizations, I wouldn't have lost. But what was really eye-opening was all of a sudden the Pistons who were the leading candidate walking in, like who I would have died to work for, all of a sudden, once you start to circle back and understanding the bigger picture, your priorities of what you're looking for could change and adjust. And I was open to that, you know? Uh-huh. So I ended up taking the job with the Indiana Pacers over the Pistons. Um, wow. So yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting, you know, turn of events. Like I would have never bet that I would have not gone to the Pistons, um, but that experience really opened my eyes to the opportunity and a bigger picture perspective. Yes. I, I love that, that whole story. I feel like you could write a book just on that part of your career <laughs> alone. And it sounds like to me, and obviously I want your take, but it sounds like to me, those, those four years in between that first job fair and then the last one, like you took the advice that served that, right. That served you felt right for you. You went and tried to get transferable skills. So you were, you know, waiting tables to get some sort of sales experience. And I'm sure there's other things that you did. I'm sure you're a great student. You know what I mean? Like you did all these things and then you came back and you're like, okay, I'm here now I'm ready. And, And I didn't say this, but every year I went back to my career fair. Mm. I did a touch point back at that career fair every year. So I didn't just go back the freshman year. I went back the second year and had the same conversation. Like, Hey, I was here last year and this is what they told me. And this is what I did. What else can I do? And I went back again, you know? And so it was, a, it was a annual consistent part of my process. I, I just feel like we, like someone should have followed you with a camera those whole, weeks, you know, <laughs> you know, I think, years. I think my, I think if there's a characteristic that really describes sort of my approach to things is determination. When I want mm-hmm. something or I yeah. see something that I want to do, like I will do whatever it takes to understand what it takes to be there. And mm-hmm. I think that was sort of the first reward, maybe the second reward, because, you know, during sports in general in high school and my grades and things like that, that was getting to college was one. Then two was getting to the NBA, getting that sort of dream opportunity to get into the industry. And then it just kept going. So like, you know, when you have these sort of positive outcomes from your actions, you want to continue to invest in that same process. So it's the consistency that helps mm-hmm. sort of impact or help define that, that characteristics of determination. You can't just be in the moment, get the moment and then give up on that. You got to continuously feed that, mm-hmm. that vision. Now tell everybody, and then I have some questions about all the jobs that you've had. Tell everybody what you do now and who you do it for. 
Today, I serve as the Chief Revenue Officer for the Houston Dynamo FC, Houston Dash, and PNC Stadium of the MLS and NWSL. This is the start of my fourth season with the team and in, in, uh, within this league, and um, it's been incredible. So my responsibilities, I, I'm responsible for the creation and execution of strategies to generate revenue for the club. So I uh, oversee all of ticket sales, service, premium, uh, all of our partnership, corporate partnership sales, and marketing, and then our business intelligence and analytics teams. Yeah, you have a, you have a big job. And then when I was doing my homework, I was like, I, I don't know, like I could do a case study on this, like just watching your career and your trajectory. So I guess my first question about your, your experience is looking at, you know, you went from, let's see here, Detroit, right? Yeah. So you went from Detroit where you were working for the Detroit Lions and then you were a season uh, ticket sales consultant. And then your next role after that was director level. Mm -hmm. And to me, that jumped out because so often women, you know, come to me, well, I feel like I need to be the coordinator first, then the manager, then this. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be that way. Everyone's path is absolutely different. Right. I actually talked about this on my podcast, a number of episodes about how there's a statistic and I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but like something like men will, you know, apply for a job when they're 50 or 60% have the skills or experiences to do the job or women will wait until they have almost a hundred percent of the skills are outlined. That's a great example of that. So, you know, I started off with the Pacers and group sales and I was up for a potential manager of group sales position at the Pacers that I ultimately just did not get. And that helped define for me that I wanted to then lead at a higher level. That's when I sort of determined like, okay, like I want ready for this and I'm focused here, but ultimately where do I want to, where do I see myself in leadership? I've now determined I want to be a leader. Where do I want to see myself? And at that point I thought, gosh, I would love to lead my own ticket sales and service team. I want to be a vice president of ticket sales and service. And I sort of pin that as an aspirational goal for myself. And I realized that when you take a look again, going back at being sort of a student of this industry, most individuals that were growing into VP of ticket sales people were people who were selling season tickets and became an inside sales manager, became the director of group sales, no, sorry, ticket sales, and then became a VP. At that time, you didn't see a lot of people going from group sales into those roles. And I was a group sales person. So I decided because I didn't get the manager of group sales, I was going to then take and go somewhere else to learn and develop my, my season ticket sales skills. So I went to the Detroit Lions. And so that's when I went to the Lions and I was there for about five months and the Pacers called me back and said, Hey, we, we know we didn't hire as a manager. We're making some adjustments to what we decided to do then. And we want to talk to you about becoming, coming back and becoming the group director. So that's how the director group. So I came back to the director groups, had an interview and then got the job. So it was interesting, but in terms of that path, you know, that's, the lion's position was the last position I like actually applied for. After that, mm. everything else has been more of a recruitment concept. Yeah. Say more, say more about that. So I don't believe in the whole, let me say this to like set the stage. I don't believe in the whole, like you need to stay somewhere for 10 years or to, you know what I mean? Like you don't need to stay there forever. And just to prove yourself or think like I had a job for five months in your case, or I have a client who had a job for a year. She's like, isn't it going to look bad on my resume if I take this other job? you know, and, and my advice to her was very specific to her needs, but mm-hmm. you know, the, the bottom line was no, no, yeah. I mean, <laughs> not at ultimately all. it's, it's based on, you know, for me, when those situations stream on, like if I worked somewhere for five months, like, and I, I have it in my resume, you know, there in my LinkedIn, yeah. like, does that look bad? I go, no, it's just a part of my story, you know? Yeah. And, and how am I presenting that stage of my career and what impact did that have? on my experiences that make me who I am today. And you got to know, you have to understand those components. It could be a year, it could be two years, it could be three years. It, it doesn't matter to your point. It really matters is what impact did that have on your skills experiences? And it might not even be like actual work related. It could be more about what you learned about your unlocking some opportunity to lead or to take on a different responsibility. It could be a personal move too. I mean, it's just being understanding of those and how you communicate those in a way where somebody can connect with it and understand it. For each move for me, yeah. you know, I've talked about this before. It's like I get into a role and I want to do the best I can in that position and I want to master it 
and I want to graduate from it. My goal is to graduate from the role, not get comfortable. So I will challenge myself. I will find areas of opportunity of growth. My, my team now knows this, like we have this sort of guiding principle of our culture you know, on the revenue team. It's about always putting yourself in growth mode. It's like a gear that you always have on in ways in which you're thinking about how am I getting better and bettering myself tomorrow so that I can make it greater impact you know, for the future. So that's sort of how I've seen it. And I think there's been a natural feeling for me too. I, maybe it's just instilled in college and high school, but that four-year mark is sort of where I start to feel like, you know, after four years, I should be graduating. Yeah. That's not always the case, you know, and graduation could be in the same role, but taking on more responsibility. It could be a number of different ways, but how are you thinking about growth? And, and, I, and I always say like, it's okay too, if you're somebody who just wants to feel consistent in your moment too. So, you know, I think that's the hard part too, in our, in our business or any industry, it's like, if you're not growing, you're, you're sort of, you know, nothing. It's like, no, that's not true. It's, do you feel complete? I need more. Some people feel complete in other ways. And I respect every aspect of it. Amen to that. (laughs) I have always felt the way you do in terms of like that graduation. I like the way you say it. I would always say, I don't like to maintain the programs I I create. So I'm just maintaining them. Like that's that's kind of boring. Like I want yeah, the that's next not, That's not me. Challenge. That's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. Like I want the next challenge. I want to move on. And mm-hmm. I think, honestly, I'm like, I'm doing a disservice to the organization. Like you're paying me too much to just oversee this. Like, let me train somebody <laughs> and then let me go get another job. Right. Like you can help me even find that job, but I'm doing a disservice to you. And so I'm not same way of thinking. However, I have encountered and I've learned the hard way that not everyone thinks that. And I had an employee come into my office and close the door and she said, is it okay if I don't want to be like you? And I was like, you're going to have to expand here because I'm not really <laughs> what sure what to What did I do to think. not attract you to this role? <laughs> yeah. And she's like, well, I just want to be a mom. And I like, my career is not the most important thing to me. And I eventually don't want to work. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad you said something. Yes, that's right for you. Please don't ever lose that. Like, yeah, that's what right. you can do. I don't expect you to stay in this role forever, whether it's because you move on, you grow into another position or because you go and be a mom with this, which is a harder job. You should get paid so much more. As important and hard. Yes. Yeah. And everybody has their thing. And I think that's the biggest thing is understanding and having empathy as a leader, put yourself in their shoes and why that's important to them. And the hard, you know, I've had summer conversations, you know, where, you know, somebody had said that they didn't want to grow because they wanted to be a mom. And I'm like, well, you can be both. (laughs) <laughs> like, I just want to put it out yeah. there. You can be both. And yeah. I would challenge you to explore that thought and you might still end up where you're at. You know, I, I remember saying like really explaining to this individual, like you have so much talent and so much to give. And I think the industry would benefit greatly if you were somebody that continued to grow, but you got to oh. do what's going to make you happy. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it was one of those really eye opening conversations. Hey, Game of Her Own listeners, it is back. I'm talking about the Be Seen and Heard at Work group coaching experience. I'm talking about the program that will help you level up in your career. Women have joined this program because they have felt defeated, not being able to move their career to the next level. They have felt emotionally drained because they are stuck. They have felt frustrated because they are not seen and heard at work. They are done with not growing in their careers and refuse to continue to let it negatively impact their personal lives. In our group coaching program, you will build a strong executive presence. Learn how to advocate for yourself without feeling like you're bragging. Quiet the self-doubt that holds you back and be the change agent that uses their voice and speaks truth to power. If you want early access to this program, join the waiting list. It is that simple. Scroll down to the bottom of the show notes to where it says, join the be seen and heard waiting list. Click it. It takes legit less than 30 seconds to sign up. All right, friends, back to why you're really here. Talk to us a little bit about your journey. So the last job you actually applied for was with the Pacers. And then, you know, you were with the NBA, you were with Cleveland, the Cavaliers, and now you're with Houston. Talk to us a little bit about what that was like being recruited. And then also the negotiation process, which everybody loves to talk about, but hates to do. And so I think we can learn something from you and just how you made sure that you got paid your value. 
when I was with the Pacers, you know, I ended there as a senior director um, of ticket sales and service. And similar to kind of the first time I was had a potential to, you know, interview for the VP position. I was in the interim position for about a year and a half. Um, and then came down to the end where they ended up hiring somebody externally. And I think the biggest thing for me there was like, I had just sort of unlocked this level of leadership that I felt really confident in being able to lead at the VP level at the Pacers. At that point, we had just gotten through the lockout, um, which was, which was big. And, you know, I think what at the very end of it, I realized like, I don't want to just, as we just talked about, I don't want to just sit here knowing my capacity and then stay complacent into the role I was doing when I know I have the ability to grow and do more and make a greater impact, make a difference. And so I sort of started to explore and started having those conversations with individuals. And that's when um, a conversation sparked between myself and uh, the leadership at the league office. And I think the, the great thing there is because of the time I was sort of leading the ticket sales and service area in this interim time frame before they made their decision on the VP, it exposed me to them at, in a really good way. They had an opening that hadn't been posted yet. And we started conversations from there. And for me, I had never seen myself leaving a team. I was so, you know, sort of uh, narrow focused, you know, to what my potential was. And I'll be honest, the NBA scared me. You know, these are very intelligent group of intelligent individuals that come from, you know, <laughs> Ivy League schools and just incredible backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I'm this 28 year old first generation grad from a Mac college. Like, I just didn't feel like I, I met the caliber of the talent and I was just taken back when, you know, we were talking about this potential, like we should have a conversation about this role. And um, I got approval from the Pacers to have the conversation and went out to New York, had this incredible interview. It felt like a movie. You ever been in a situation where you're like, I'm, I'm like playing, like I'm in somebody else's life. That's what the NBA, you know, sort of hiring process yeah. was for me. Cause I just, it just seemed like it was a out of my realm when I got there, I was like, wow, like I, maybe I am connected. Maybe there is something that I could impact. And it just was so right. You know? So I, I, yeah. this is one of my favorite parts of my, my story because I go home from this interview on top of the world thinking, wow, I could live in New York and which was a dream of mine and work for the NBA and just like help the league yeah. on a greater scale. And uh, a couple of days after my interview, I come home and I, t I tell my husband, I go, there's something, there's something up. Like, I think I have to take a pregnancy test. And he's like, what? I'm like, I do. I, I have to take a pregnancy test. There's definitely, we're missing something here. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> so uh, I take a, I take a pregnancy test. I'm pregnant. And I get the call that Friday, two days later that they're going to offer me the job to be a director at Teambo and travel and, you know, consult teams. Yeah. And, and immediately I, I tell them, you know, I really want to take this job. This is, this is the dream right here. But I just want to make you aware that I literally took a pregnancy test two days ago and my husband, and I found out we're pregnant. I haven't seen a doctor or anything yet, but, but I just wanted to let you know that. And they were super supportive. I go, listen, like, I know that I'm just crazy enough to figure this out. My husband's RN, he, he worked three nights, you know? So it's like the travel is like four days and then you have three days off basically, or you're working from home. So I knew that there was an opportunity to make it all work. And so I, I said, you know, I, I'm, I, I believe that I can do it. And they're like, well, if you believe in you, we believe in you. We'd love to have you. So hopefully that doesn't you know, change your mind. I said, no, I'm going to take it. So I took it knowing I was pregnant. And um, the Pacers said that I needed to, their only request before leaving was that we were in the playoffs. So can I stay on board, mm -hmm. help us get us through the playoffs? And then I would proceed, you know, to league. So this is like May something. So I ended up, um, <laughs> going to the doctors because we're, you know, between the meeting and I go to the doctor's appointment and we find out we're having twins. And it was like, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> well, can this really be happening? Like, this is really happening. Like, come on, like, this is crazy. So I call the league back and I tell them I'm having twins. There's really no potential in me moving to New York at that point. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to make this happen. I still want to proceed, but we're going to make some adjustments. My husband and I had talked through him staying home and the whole thing. And they were very supportive. They uh, were very supportive of me not moving to New York and, you know, sort of working out a market because I'm traveling anyways. And that was pretty common for some individuals. And then at that moment, I used that as a potential opening to negotiate my salary. Like all of a sudden, my circumstances were changed. I'm not only thinking about me. It's going to be me, two kids and a husband that's going to stay home 
And I sort of presented what I needed and they gave it to me. And so it was a really remarkable experience. And my husband and I moved you know, to Michigan and we set up shop and I traveled every week from Michigan. I was on a plane every Monday morning and back and we just circle repeat all the way through until my twins were about a year and a half. Um, wow. Right. And I think it was in those moments that was the first time I had negotiated and discussed salary. And I was at such a vulnerable place that it was just authentically an open conversation. And I have taken that experience and every experience moving forward. Just I know what the value I'm the value I have is. I know the value of the role. And then I know what I need. It's like those three things that you go in and you have to have an honest conversation about your expectations. And, and it's always been from there, always a, a, a really good conversation. I haven't always gotten exactly what I wanted, but I got enough to know that our needs are taken care of in addition uh-huh. to the expectations of the role. That is an incredible story. Like, Isn't that crazy? That's you, a whole nother chapter, right? <laughs> yeah. It's just like, gosh, should we pause? Like we can have five episodes just on like this. Like that is it. Like, and it sounds like, right. I don't know how you felt when you were in it. But mm-hmm. now looking back and now hearing you tell the story to me, it just looks like, oh, like you just did it all. You did everything right. Like you were honest, open. you talked about it with um, the league. You had a mm-hmm. conversation. Hey, I'm pregnant. I haven't even gone to the doctor. I'm telling <laughs> you because it's the right thing to do. And yeah, I mean, it's the right. Exactly. It's the right thing to do. And it's just that, sort of that we talk about vulnerability and empathy and it's just sort of the exposure. And as women, sometimes we, we see that as a... Um, a bad thing, a negative thing and be, and be processed negatively. But if you're talking to the right people, and that's the first thing, I think it's about realizing that this is a good situation. I wouldn't have taken the job if I didn't think I was going to be working for great people in a great environment with a great culture. And I think that's the basis of it. And every place I've been, it's one of the main things I think about. If I can't have an honest conversation with you about something that's important to me and my family and my well-being, then if you don't feel that comfort, that should be a flag for you if they don't make you feel like you could have the conversation. And even asking permission for the conversation might be the first step of, of testing those waters. Yeah. Like, like when you're in an interview and they offer you a position with a salary or whatever, or a package, and you can say, um, is this package negotiable? You know, there's some things that I, I need to consider and I'd love to come back and have a, a conversation about the package. Is that, are you guys open to that conversation? They'll say yes or no, you know? And if they say no, hopefully they have a why. They get budgets are strict. And, you know, sometimes we just have, you know, teams are in a situation or organizations are in a situation. I think you have the right to do that. Yeah, that's an, I, that's an incredible story and incredible advice right there. Like that little snippet could have been the, the episode. And I, I think that's gold right there for everybody. Uh, before we move on to rapid fire questions. Mm-hmm. Didn't know you were getting those, did you? Um, No, I did not. You did not warn me. (laughs) (laughs) I did not. Tell everybody about your podcast, Women Blazers. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Yeah, I I host a podcast called Women Blazers. Just finished season two. I I structured it in a way that I could manage it around my, obviously my other priorities and responsibilities. I I consider the podcast like a passion project of mine. I'd launched it at the beginning of of the pandemic and I had plans to launch it prior to the pandemic um, and sort of shelved it. And so the pandemic really just gave me sort of the opportunity to launch it without a lot of outside forces challenging me on how I could keep it up. So yeah, it's a, it's a great podcast. It's basically it features conversations with um, women in the industry, such as, as you, you guys do as well. The big purpose here for me was, is about, you know, amplifying voices in the industry. And there was this, these conversations that really, motivated me to launch it was I was having multiple conversations with people in the last couple of years leading up to it about how this is a male dominated industry and all of the things that you hear about sports. And I'm like, you know what? Like there are a lot of women like kicking ass and dominating and you should know them. And when I would bring up somebody's name or somebody's situation, they're like, no, I don't know that person. Like, how do you not know this person? I'm like, well, you really look at the research and like, where, where do you find these women? If you don't already know them or have introduced to them, you know, there's no place where you can you can meet them, you know, in their industry. So I, the podcast was just a great way of introducing them, you know, and then telling their stories and hopefully inspiring other people to realize like there's so many different paths to your success. And every single one of these women have such unique paths and unique stories and, and everything led to exactly where they were intended to be today. So hopefully it's inspiring, motivating, and just sort of eye-opening. 
you know, to the industry. Yeah. Well, congratulations on two seasons. Thank you. Thank you. When do you come back? When season three? March. Can everyone expect you March? Yeah. So March, I haven't set my date yet, but I, I, I launch it in international women's month. And then I do every, every other Monday for 40 weeks up until like right before Christmas. So we, we end, I end it right before the new year. It gives me a nice solid opportunity to launch my season because the MLS season kicks off in February. Mm. So this is a really busy time in our world. So it really worked out really well with international women's not being in March. And I'm already, sort of already off in, in the season at that point. So the timing worked out perfectly. So there's some strategy there to make it all <laughs> work in my world. Night. I was going to say what, three children, correct? Three, yeah, three. So the twins are nine now and they just had a birthday. And then my littlest one is four, a little girl. So the twins are boy, girl, and then the, the littlest one's four. Okay. So three children, husband, C-suite job. Like I'm going to brag on you for a moment. Not that you absolutely do not need me to, but like, it's no joke. Like I see why you're a sports business journal game changer. Like th- that makes sense. Like you are, and, and you have your podcast, like, and that, there's, I'm sure a thousand things we didn't even talk about on this during this interview. So uh, congratulations to you. I know that was last year, but congratulations. Or Thank two years ago so now. Yeah. Yeah. 2020. Yeah. yeah 2020. Went by fast. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate yeah. the kind words. And I will link to your podcast in the show notes uh, for everyone to go check it out if they haven't already. Thank you very much. All right. Let's wrap it up with some rapid fire questions. First one. First thing that comes to mind, there's 12 questions. Super, super easy. I like to think they're easy. <laughs> All right. First one. What's your favorite sports moment? Winning the, the Cavs championship game seven in Golden State. Oh, nice. I was there with my husband. It was incredible. What is something people always get wrong about you? That I'm scary. I used to get that too. Oh yeah. Like I hear like, Oh, you're, you know, Deanna, like, I mean, I'm maybe not, maybe not the person you would like run up and like give a hug to, but, <laughs> like, <laughs> but like I'm, I would do anything for anyone, you know? And that's probably the hardest feedback when somebody's like, Oh, they're, they're scared of you. I'm like, what are they scared about? That's, that's a hard one to take, but that is probably the, the one that shocks. Yeah. Me. I can, I can relate. Yeah. What's one food you wouldn't want to give up? Candy. <laughs> <laughs> I should have skipped that one or, or answered group. it that's for a food you. Group in my world. <laughs> what, wait, what's your favorite candy? Oh, Sour Patch. Anything sugary. I'm not a chocolate eater. So anything with sour sugar. Yeah. Good, good to know. <laughs> Are you a morning <laughs> person or a night person? Night. I never sleep. I'll say that. I don't. Wow. Favorite holiday? It, probably Christmas now. Now that I have kids, Christmas has taken a whole new meaning, but. I wasn't a big holiday person growing up. All right. What job would you be absolutely horrible at doing? I would give any job Deanna's best try, but probably a teacher. Oh, that right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't expect that. Yeah. I, I love leading, but like a teacher in a classroom. I don't know. We were just talking about this. My husband and I were talking about this the other day. There's something about, because you don't get to, you don't get to pick like, you know, your students and there's like a curriculum and you have to, you have to do what you're told to teach. And, I don't know. I just didn't have a hard time, like feeling the freedom of teaching, but yet be sort of in a box, you know, it'd be hard. Right. You know All what right. I mean? I think that'd be really hard. I have a lot of respect for teachers. And I think that's why it'd be really hard for me. Like, I, I just don't know how they do what they do. It's an amazing job. Yeah. I don't know how they do what they do. I felt that way before 2020. So now I'm <laughs> right? like, and the virtual and just all oof. of it, man. I have to deal with my own kids to deal with 20 other kids that aren't my own kids. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> Yes, I feel the same way and I have zero kids. So <laughs> what products would you seriously stockpile if you found out they weren't going to sell it anymore? Probably one of my candies. Sounds right. Def- yeah, definitely. What's your favorite app? I love Spotify. I just love like this, like every song that you've ever thought of just at your fingertips. Like, <laughs> yes. you know what I mean? Like I can, like, I just love music is, you know, one of those just things for me that I always tap into when I need to feel something or, you know, help categorize the mood. I love mm-hmm. music. Yeah. So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram. I like Twitter. Yeah. I've never gotten into Twitter. I try all the time. And I'm like, this is too much. <laughs> it's overwhelming. It's the one platform. I think it's the one platform I've probably been most consistent with when it first launched. So mm. like, yeah, I enjoy it. I think it allows for, you get obviously news related content and very immediate information but also allows for you to have 
personality and interaction in that way. So yeah, I've always liked, liked Twitter. All right. You're early adopter. I see you. <laughs> Who is your biggest inspiration in life? Oh, my kids. Definitely my kids. Yeah. I haven't had that answer before. I love that. Yeah. My kids really, really inspire. I think it's weird too, because you, to your point, you don't have children yet. I didn't know, you know, like I knew, I know this is supposed to be rapid fire. So now I feel like I'm going off yeah. the grid here. So I apologize. So I categorize motivations and inspirations a specific way. So motivations to me are like sort of derived from this pace of anger and fear and sort of, ugh, you know, where inspiration is more derived from a place of love. And I would say most of the beginning of my determination of my career and my life was all driven off these motivations of like the best revenge was to live the great life, you know, kind of concept. Yeah. It was like, that was like one of my favorite quotes. And then I started to sort of shift about like someday I want to have a family and what, what kind of lifestyle. And so my children are having a family before ever even having a family was one of my biggest in- inspirations about what kind of life do I want to give them, you know, that I didn't have or those sort of mm. pieces. And so they've, they've been a huge inspiration to me. Mm. I love that. And I love that explanation and the difference between the two and like how you shift, like how you shifted mm-hmm. over time. Like every, we all have different seasons and we're not the same people. We just continue to evolve. Correct. And there's times where, yeah, the motivations are still there, but the inspiration always overpowers all of that now. Well said. Thank you. As a child, what did you wish to become when you grew up? My first dream job. I mean, I wanted to be, I wanted to be the first, you know, woman in the NBA. Like I thought that was going to be it. And then 1998 rolled around. I was like, oh, WNBA. I want to rock the W. (laughs) (laughs) So always, always was trying to be a basketball player. (laughs) <laughs> All right. That last one. Finish this sentence. The future of women working in sports is limitless. I agree. Deanna, this has been such a pleasure. I am so grateful that we finally got to meet. Yeah. Um, everyone who told me that I should meet, right. Everyone told me that I should meet you. They were right. And thank you for accepting my, uh, when I slid into your DMs, cause I didn't want anyone to introduce us. I wanted to do it on my own. <laughs> So thank you for responding. This has been a pleasure. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, how could they do so? Um, I'm on um, obviously LinkedIn. You know, you can, you connect to me. I, I do answer my messages, you know, maybe not as frequently or quickly as I want, but LinkedIn is a great way to connect with me. I'm on Instagram at dwitter2 or Women Blazers, and then um, Twitter, dwdynamo underscore dynamo. Perfect. We will link to all those in the show notes. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you, Jahan. So what did you think of this episode? Do you know another woman who works or is aspiring to work in sports? Would you do me a favor and share this with them? It would mean so much if together we could support and inspire other women on their journey. And let's stay connected. I love meeting and talking to new people. Follow me on Instagram at Jahan Blake and join the free game of her own community by visiting jahanblake.com. I can't wait to meet you.